Abba Yahweh, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that we can trust you at it and that everything that you say, Lord, through your word is not only true, but it's transforming. It helps us, God, little by little, like dashes on a highway, Lord, it teaches us which lane to be in and, and when to get off and when to stay and when to pass. And, and Father Yahweh, we just ask that, that your guardrails tonight, your word would teach us uh, to stay in your will. Father, I pray that nothing I will say will be of me, but everything I say will be of you. And God, I pray that you just transform someone's life in the sound of my voice, in Yeshua's name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about the Torah portion this week, and it's actually two portions, uh, Tezria and Metzorah, and, uh, and that is, uh, in, in English, it's she will conceive and a leper. So there's actually two different portions we're going to talk about out of Leviticus chapter 12 will be that she will conceive and the purity and laws of Nidah. Isn't that fun? Aren't you excited? You can't wait for that teaching. And, uh, and then the second part, we'll be diving into Leviticus chapter 13, where it talks about uh, uh, Lashan Hara, uh, Metzorah, the leper, the laws of leprosy. We'll dive into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, extract some of that out of there. We're even going to go to Isaiah chapter 53 and show some connections on Yeshua and why he's so involved with leprosy uh, in his ministry. Uh, and I think that at the end of this short teaching... I know some of you just chuckled when I said short. But at the end of this message, I believe that you're going to have a lot larger or more appreciation for your word that you read every single day, okay? All right, let's begin. First and foremost, turn with me in your Bibles to Leviticus, Vayikra chapter 12. Let's unravel some mysteries here, a lot of uh, uh, misunderstandings especially in the Messianic movement on this particular chapter. There's not a lot of commentary that the Scriptures give on this because the Scriptures love, Yahweh loves to be uh, mystical sometimes and when He gives us instructions, number, number one, or it was very well known at the time. He didn't have to give a lot of commentary. So let's talk about it. We're going to talk about these uh, ceremonial rituals after childbirth or the commandments of childbirth. What did God say when there's a child born? What is clean and unclean? Uh, and uh, Tahor and Tameh, and what, is that, what does this look like? So then Yahweh spoke to Moses in verse 1, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and bore a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. Now, if you look at the word customary there, that is nidah, okay? And so in Hebrew, you'll talk, you hear about the laws of nidah, uh, that is the, the, the laws of, uh, of ritual impurity, okay? And so we want to talk about what that looks like for just a few minutes before we dive into the second Torah portion of Metzorah. Because there's just too much confusion about this. All right, so if she has a boy, then she's unclean for seven days, just like the, Nadi, the, 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 the laws of, of Nadi, okay? All right. All right, so when you're looking at the laws of Nadah, first of all, we've got our normal, regular, monthly cycle for a woman. That causes her to be clean for seven days, all right? So we don't have time to go through this, but if you go to, to Leviticus chapter 15, you'll see this. But you have the laws of Nadah, normal cycle, seven days from the first day of blood. At the end of seven days, she's no longer unclean. Okay, now today in Judaism, they add an extra seven days. That's just the rabbinical halakha. That's just uh, the, uh, the tradition that to make it easier to make sure there's absolutely no blood whatsoever. But in Bible times, at the end of seven days, you would mikvah and then you are clean. All right. Now, if there is still blood at the end of seven days, you would have to count another seven days. Once those seven days are over, mikvah and you're clean so just remember that for a second because that's going to be important right here because a lot of people believe that the laws of nidah have to do with uh, uh, the idea of a husband and wife having intimate relationships with one another it does only for those seven days so when a, when a woman has a child a lot of people especially in the messianic movement look at it and say okay i have to wait 60 days 
or 40 days if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a male and 80 days if it's a female, that's not true at all, okay? And that's what I want to unpack for you just for a few minutes, just to make this uh, very clear. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So she has a son, seven days she's unclean, and look what we have here. Interestingly enough, on the eighth day, there is a circumcision. Now, we know that in science, the blood coagulates on the eighth day, and so God's a really smart God. But look, there's another thing here. She's unclean for seven days. Anything she touches is unclean. Do you understand? For seven days. So you cannot have a child that gets circumcised that's unclean. So her cleanliness or her laws of purity last seven days and then on the eighth day regardless of her situation she's declared clean that's what the bible says which is why on the eighth day she can participate and the child itself is clean and can be circumcised then she continues in the blood of her purification for 33 more days now look at that it does not say the blood of her impurity or her uncleanliness it's the there's a difference there is unclean tame and then there's purification from that and this is the commu- the, commu- the communication error in uh, in us gentiles in the messianic movement is we don't understand the difference between that and so it, it is very much like okay i am sick i go to the emergency room and they get me something to fix me And then I go through the process of healing. So the unclean part would be in the ER. And then when I come out, I have the medication and now I'm on the upswing. It doesn't mean that I'm healed. It means I'm in the purification part of healing. Does that make sense? It does not mean while I'm in that purification part that I am tame or unclean. I know it's hard for us to wrap our brain around because we're we're American, and this, some of this language is difficult for us. But the way that the Bible uh, puts it, it's very simple. Seven days, you're unclean, as in the days of Nidah. It's the, what he's doing is referring to the exact laws of Nidah, which says that you're impure for seven days. Has nothing to do with intimacy. So after you're clean, declared clean, technically... You can be intimate with your spouse regardless of male or female. The only problem with that is that if you go to the laws of Nadah, it gives you instruction that if you're still bleeding, you have to wait till you're done bleeding, count another seven days, and then you can be intimate with your spouse, okay? Because a lot of people that come in this movement, they have children and they, you know, they pray for a boy (laughs) because a girl is 80 days, uh, At least all the husbands are praying for her son. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's interesting that science, our doctors tell you, medical science says, uh, six weeks is about the time where, where your body is completely healed. And that's about the time when, uh, when your body is completely healed. God makes it just clear you are not allowed to be intimate while blood. But as far as inside of that time period, from the time that that woman is declared clean to the time of the 40 or the 80 days, it's totally just dependent on her own body, okay? So I just want to dispel that myth that you cannot be intimate with your spouse during that 40 or 80 day time period. Bet you never heard a message on this before. (laughs) All right, but I want to make a connection here spiritually because as I was praying about this, I thought, you know, God, why did you say seven and eight circumcision? And, and 33 on top of that for a male. And the Lord just opened my eyes and said, Adam was the first male. He was God's firstborn son. He was not supposed to sin. And from the beginning of the time of Adam to the time where the second Adam would come would be how many days prophetically? Seven days. Because he comes, excuse me, at the end of the sixth day, does he not? So there are seven prophetic days, one per thousand years. So we are in that sixth millennium waiting for the Messiah to come back. So technically, until the new heavens and the new earth, there are seven days where we are technically unclean. 
The earth is still unclean. That's why he hasn't created it yet. He's waiting for the seventh day. He's paused. There's Shabbat on the seventh day. And then he creates new heaven, new earth. And by the way, it's the eighth day that a priest becomes a priest. It's seven days and on the eighth day. He becomes a priest. There's a whole teaching on that that I've done in the past. And it's all connected to each millennium. So seven days of uncleanliness. And on the eighth day, Adam, us, God's people are circumcised. And that's when we become priests in the eighth day. Uh, Interestingly enough, it also says not only for seven days. And then on the eighth day be circumcised. Then she continues for 33 days. In her purification. How old was Yeshua when he died? Coincidence, probably. Or is it he's connecting to the laws of Nidah that says that for a son, you have to continue at the moment of his birth, it's 33 years to purify. At the end of 33 years, 33 days, technically pure. Does that make sense? Does anybody follow me on that? Yes. Okay. All right, and then it goes into the laws of Nidah for having a female child, where the woman or the mother is unclean for two weeks, and then she goes for 66 days. And a lot of rabbis ask the question, well, why is it twice as long for a female as it is for a male and I believe the best answer is very simple is from a a male cannot progenate from a male cannot come new life it is from a female that comes new life and so her by by default because she's a female having a girl she's carrying more than just her even though it's a baby girl she has the ability to reproduce when she's old enough so there is a twice as long of a process of purification. Okay. So then she says in verse 8, God says, and if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she'll be clean. This drove the Jewish people crazy, this law, because it said that you had to bring a lamb and then you had to bring another animal for a sin offering. And the question became, was it a sin to have children? How can it be a sin to have children? Because God commands you to be fruitful and multiply and have children. So, So what is with this sin offering? Did you know that every other, every other law that dealt with uncleanliness, do you know how you became clean? Water. You just immersed that evening in a mikvah and you were clean. This is the only one when you're unclean that you have to actually bring a sin offering and mikvah, which I think is beautiful because what it is, it's actually going back to the ancient concept in year one where Adam sinned and when Adam sinned he brought forth sin spiritually into his DNA to the next generation so what they're doing is it has nothing to do with the woman's sin she did not sin it's the concept that I have brought forth a child and this child is born into sin and so I am not giving an offering for me My offering is for my child. He is being born, get this, into the spirit of forgiveness immediately. He is covered in blood. It is the concept that Yeshua is going to bring up later of being born again. Is that when a child is born for the first time, he's born through water and covered in blood. In the same way, you can be born once through your your mother's water, but until you are covered in blood, you're not born again. And so believe it or not, these strange laws of Nidah that are found all the way back in the book of Vayikra Leviticus are not so strange. They got the gospel written all over them. 
We just have to see it properly so that we can see that we not only need to be birthed through water, but we need to be covered in blood. Amen? All right, now, that was the fun one. Let's move on to the next one. Leviticus chapter 13, the laws concerning leprosy. And don't let me forget, we're going to come back to the idea of why does he connect, look at this, leprosy with these strange laws of giving birth. Tame and Tahor, clean and unclean, and now he's moving right into leprosy. What a strange topic. So Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, when a man has on the skin of his body a swelling or a scab or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priest. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair on the sore has turned white and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of the body, it is a leprous sore. Then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him tame, unclean. If the bright spot is white on the skin of his body and excuse me, does not appear to be deeper than the skin and its hair has not turned white, then the priest shall isolate the one who has the sore seven days. The priest shall examine him and on the seventh day, and indeed, if the sore appears to be as it was, and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him another seven days. Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day, and indeed, if the sore has faded and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him tahor, clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. All right, so let's stop for right, here, for right now and just, I've talked about this many, many times, how leprosy or zarat, which is not really leprosy, but it's because uh, it can be mold, it's a disease, okay, that's on the surface of something. And zarat is connected to lashon hara or evil speech. So when you speak, what comes out actually creates what becomes of you and what becomes of other people. Miriam, if you recall, says evil speech about Moses, says, look, I don't know why uh, he has to, Moses has to marry uh, this woman. I disagree with this. And instantly she has Zerat. She has a disease of leprosy that covers her because you're not supposed to speak against an elder. God deals with those people himself. And so you see that, that Lashon hara, or evil speech, is connected to what we look like. It's connected to our physical presence, and it determines where we go and what we do in the spiritual realm. So now you don't see this in the physical realm anymore, okay? But God, if you speak evil of someone, you're not going to see it most likely in the physical realm. It may show up in other ways, but in the spiritual realm, you have zarat. Now, let me explain to you how serious this is. Zerat restricts you where you can go in the spiritual realm. Understand what I'm about to go through tonight because this message, I believe, is is very gravitational of why Yeshua came at all. You cannot go certain places. It's like in in certain times, uh, slaves would have to announce themselves by wearing a certain color or or be branded. or, or, Or when the Jewish people were, during the Holocaust, they had to wear the yellow star. It restricted where they could go. It was the outer garments that restricted in the physical realm where they could go. In the same way, what you appear in the spiritual realm, God restricts you. So there are times, let me give you some crazy stuff that's happened to me, that's happened to other people, is that you may think that you are totally accepted by God, but you have gossiped or you've slandered and and you've not made it right, you've not followed the strict formula in God's Word and His Torah on how to take care of that. But how many know we're really good at forgiving ourselves? You know, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. And then we say, God, would you please forgive me because I recognize I really shouldn't have done that. God says, I I, I forgive you. And then because you don't know Torah, you get excited. God forgave me. I'm great now. I'm fine. I'm I'm, I'm back in, 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 in in my alignment with him. No. He said he forgave you. That doesn't mean that you have restoration with him. And this is a a Hebrew concept that us Greek Christians do not understand. Just because God forgives you does not mean that you get to live close to Him. 
Otherwise, there would not be different levels in heaven. How many know that in Matthew chapter 7, he says, look, don't teach that the law of God is done away with because those who teach that God's law is done away with will be what? Least in my kingdom. So he lets you in. Why? Because he forgave you. But you are least in the kingdom because you did not you did not do what he said to make it right with him. Big difference. How many know that you can forgive someone without them asking for forgiveness? That's really hard to do. And it takes a level of spiritual maturity to get there, does not. You can actually forgive someone completely of their sin. And even when they come to you and ask for forgiveness, you don't even feel any different because you've totally forgiven them for whatever that sin was. But just because you've forgiven them, does that mean that you want to go out to dinner with them? Does that mean that you want to have a relationship with them? You have no ill feelings with them, but there's a disconnect. Does this make sense? So there's a difference between forgiveness and actually following what the Torah says to do to bring restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, that's called restitution. You cannot run over someone's dog and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. No, look, I'm really sorry. I know I shouldn't have done that. I was, I was going way too fast. No, that other person could eventually forgive you, but until you bring restoration, a new dog with repentance, there's no way to have true restoration. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's continue. Let's back up, actually, and start from here. So here we go. We've got a skin. So I want you to look at, I'm going to reread this from the idea of Lashon Hara or leprosy of, of, the, of the tongue, gossip and slander. Look, this is how it, how it works. Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, when a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, so we're not sure, something looks like gossip. A bright spot, it becomes on the skin of the body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to the priest or one of his sons, the priest. The priest examines the sore, and look at this, and see if it turns white. And if the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore. So the priest examines him and pronounces him unclean. So in other words, every one of us have goofed up. Every one of us have fallen short of God's glory in this area. Okay? So if it becomes a basically kind of an accidental thing, it still appears to be gossip. It still is a bright spot. It still looks bad. So the priest will examine that and say, okay, is this a one-time deal or is this a problem? Is this go deeper than the skin or is just this one time they slipped up? Does that make sense? If it goes deeper than the skin, then that person has a disease inside of them. They must immediately be removed from the congregation of Israel, from the city. Now you might say, oh, man, that's mean. Who would remove someone from the city? Go back to the bubonic plague times and just give hugs to everyone. So if you want to use the idea, I had a conversation with someone uh, lately, matter of fact, a, a, a very close friend of mine, and we had a, a, a disagreement on this because I, I, my position was that principle never, excuse me, his, his, his uh, preface was principle never trumps compassion. Principle never trumps compassion. Now all of you mercy people are out there going, yeah, that sounds good. Very dangerous because it sounds so good because compassion is what we're supposed to have. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Look, my preface was no. Principle never trumps compassion when there's repentance. Principle always trumps compassion when there is no repentance. Does this make sense? This is really important that we understand this because the mercy side of people will literally unknowingly, because we don't know the instructed Word of God, we will simply take the, the, the carpet, lift it up, and put it under there and call it compassion and mercy. Now, I will tell you this. I was at my parents' house last night. They have a, a beautiful little home, and, and when they bought it, they had rugs in the basement. And the basement was partially finished, but under the rugs, it was, so, it was soft and it was wet. Now, what happens when you take wet, moist, 
and heat, put it in the basement, what happens? Mold. You know what that Hebrew word is? Zerat. And you know how, to, how, how they had to get rid of it? They had to literally gut the whole basement. Every single, matter of fact, it looks like a brand new basement. I, I, I did not even know there was anything ever built down there because it looks like an unfinished basement. They had to go all the way to the walls of the concrete. So when you have this sin in your life, that's how serious it is. It grows, and you know what? You can't even see it until it kills you because it's sporadic. It, it, it literally is airborne and can get in your lungs and kill you. It kills other people. The only way God can do it is to remove you. So if you keep mold in your house, let's pretend mold is, is a person. Let's just dispel this myth of principle never trumps compassion. We're going to call him Mr. and Mrs. Mold. Mr. and Mrs. Mold, we welcome you into our house. We love you. We know that you've been kicked out of every house in the subdivision. We know that you've got companies that have dared to form against you. There are people that make their living attacking you. We know that you're unwanted everywhere that you go. But we want you to know that Jesus loves you. And we invite you into our house, Mr. and Mrs. Mold. But you have to live in the basement. And you just be good and be nice and we'll let you stay here. Now, who in their right mind would do that? Who in their right mind, if you were looking at a house and saw a mold and say, oh, isn't it so cute? <laughs> if, you can, if you can see it, that's a bigger problem. Okay. If it's big enough to pet, that's a bigger problem. Nobody would let mold in their house. But this is exactly what we do with people that talk too much. They'll sin, they'll gossip, they'll slander, they'll say things that are unholy and untrue or true, it doesn't matter, evil speech, either way. And we invite them in and say, well, we, we, can't, we cannot remove that person Let's go back 2,000 years. We cannot remove that person from Israel. Elders, I know you're at the city gate, but are you, this person's a nice guy. He's just got a few white spots. Not a big deal. Give him a Snoopy Band-Aid. You won't even see him. They're just small. And the elders of the city gate say, no, I understand, sir, but we have, we, we have checked out, and the high priest says that the white spots go deeper than the skin. This is not just your everyday run-of-the-mouth issue. This is a disease, and it will infect all of Israel. This person is moldy. We cannot allow Mr. and Mrs. Mold in this house. It's not that we don't love Mr. and Mrs. Mold, but we have got to remove Mr. and Mrs. Mold for the sake of the rest of the community, the whole house. If, if mold or zarat is found inside of a building, they will remove every th everyone from the building. And the building is condemned. It's scrubbed down, and if it's still there, they condemn the whole thing. Did you know they do that today? That's exactly what they do. The exact instructions that God gives in His Torah for how to deal with mold is exactly how we deal with it today. Identify it. Everything's unclean. Everything gets washed down and scrubbed. If it comes back seven days later, they'll do it again. If it comes back seven, it's condemned. They can't get rid of it. It's beyond repair. So it comes back every seven days. So here's what we've got here. They're not allowed to come back into the camp. Verse 7, but if the scab should at all spread over the skin after he has been seen by the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen by the priest again. If the priest sees the scab is indeed spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. When the leprous sore is on the person, then he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the swelling on the skin is white, and it's turned the hair white, and there's a spot of raw flesh in the swelling, it's an old leprosy on the skin of his body. That's shocking to me. 
that you can actually tell someone that used to be a gossip by the scars on their skin. It's permanent. The priest shall pronounce him unclean and shall not isolate him, and shall not isolate him for he is unclean. If the leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy covers all the skin of the one who has the sore from his head to his foot, wherever the priest looks, and the priest shall consider, and indeed if the leprosy has covered all his body, he shall pronounce him clean who has the sore. It is all turned white. He's clean. But when, because there's nothing else to destroy. But when raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. Or if the raw flesh changes and turns white again, he shall come to the priest. And if the priest shall examine him, and indeed if the sore is turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. So now I want to jump down here because we have so much to go through. I'm not going to get through all of this. Let me see if I can find. Yeah, yeah, okay. There we go. Verse 40. As for the man whose hair has fallen from his head, he is bald, but he is clean. That's pretty exciting. Okay, no worries. He whose hair has fallen from his forehead, he is bald on the forehead, but he is clean. Poor bald guys. Everybody's like, oh, is that okay? Is he clean? And if there is on the bald head one, excuse me, and if there is, I'm on verse 42, and if there is on the bald head or bald forehead a reddish white sore, it is leprosy breaking out on his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall examine it. If indeed if the swelling of the sore is reddish white on, on the head or on his bald forehead, as the appearance of leprosy on the skin of the body, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall surely pronounce him unclean. His sore is on his head. Now the leper in whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare. And he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean. So what would happen is if you were unclean and you were leprous and they would put you outside of the camp. Look at the spiritual implications here. You don't know it today. We don't know it today. It manifests in the physical realm through the tongue. But in the spiritual realm, when someone goes off the deep end and begins to speak slanderously, uh, falsely or truly about someone else, instantly in the spiritual realm, there is zarat. God will remove you from his presence. Not his love. Presence. Big deal. Big difference. So if you're in a local congregation, God will remove you. Now, it might be through the elders that, they, that you were removed. It might be a circumstance that you're removed. It might be that as even, if, even if there's some sort of restoration and you ask God to forgive you and God forgives you, but you haven't done what Torah says to actually bring perfect 100% tahor clean back into the in full restoration, what God will do is He'll let you come into the, S, the, the, uh, the outskirts of the camp, but at critical moments where His presence is going to show up, He will not allow you there. And you'll think that you just got sick that day. Now, some of you, this just went way over your head. I hope that you understand what I'm just saying. But God is so brilliant on how He operates today. Don't think that His law is not in operation today. Because I could name names of people that have been completely unclean in this congregation that would let me name names if I got their permission. And they've fully come into restoration, total repentance, and God has brought them back and fully restored them ten times over. But before their restoration, I would notice that these people would be missing in very key meetings. They were sick, had to go to a wedding, Different things that happened in their life that was absolutely imperative that they were at this meeting because of what was going on, and they couldn't be there. I never understood it, but it just stuck out in my spirit until God showed me this, that they were unclean. He was preventing them from being there, or they would infect everything else in the spiritual realm. Is that, is that you tracking with me? Okay. 
So the scary part of this is that we only see in the physical realm, but God looks in the spiritual realm. So you may not even know how much you're being restricted. You could have actually a leash on and you won't even know it of what you're missing because people refuse to do the last step. The last step of of total restoration is restitution. There is no way to get around it. You must. And in some cases, you can't pay it back. How many know you, sometimes you just can't pay it back? But how many know that God wants you to try? And if you don't, guess what happens? You're, it still debits your account. You still owe in God's realm. So that person can fully forgive you. And you can have a quasi-relationship, but God will restrict your path until you fully repent. Repenting to Him is one thing. Asking forgiveness to the other person is a whole other thing. Most people don't get there. The third step is absolutely do everything you can to repair what you destroyed. You wrote a blog about someone, you better write five blogs in the good. You go on Facebook to say something negative one time, You spend 10 days saying how bad you were and how sorry you were and how wrong you were and how God has opened up your eyes and you speak nothing of life to repair that person. That's restitution. If you can't do that, your repentance is not repentance. Because you're stuck on your pride then. You can't do it. This is why very few people are able to come into the presence of God. And this is just one sin that we're talking about. Imagine all the other sins that we do if we don't know the proper protocol. How many of us grew up in Christianity learning that all we got to do is say, I'm sorry. If you were married in here, wives without any amens or head shaking, okay? (laughs) How many of you are sick and tired of your husbands just saying, honey, I'm sorry? That was a very deep amen I heard from a very manly woman in here somewhere, okay? Or did your wife just elbow you to speak it for her, okay? (laughs) Look, we got to get to this place where we understand proper protocol because proper protocol is what allows you to come deeper in fellowship with him and other people. Think about a husband and wife. Intimacy starts with just the I. Then there's relationship. Then you get married. And then there's intimacy. But there's times in your marriage where one or both parties don't want to become intimate. And guess what? It is always over sinning against one another. Intimacy starts with getting it right. There are proper protocols to approach one another and your king. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. So on the day of his cleansing... Just like the laws of Nadal. So remember I said, why did did the leper section of of this Torah portion connect into chapter 12 when it's all about the laws of Nadal? Because in the laws of Nadal, you have the clean and unclean part, seven days, and then the laws of cleansing. Here we have a leper who gets healed, and now there's the laws of cleansing. There's a difference between healing and cleansing. Difference between forgiveness and restoration. This is not taught at large in Christianity. We've just jumped it and lumped it all into one big thing. Forgiveness. Hey, wait a minute. I said I'm sorry. You're supposed to like me now. You laugh, but I mean, I've I've done that. I'll be open chested in the middle of an argument. I told my wife that. How many times do I have to say I'm sorry? You're supposed to forgive me. Be happy. (laughs) God just laughs and says, my people, they they perish for lack of knowledge. So here's the laws of cleansing. The priest goes outside of the camp. The priest shall examine him, the one that's healed. Or says he's healed. The priest examines him. Indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. 
The priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel overrunning with water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, dip them in the living dip them and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. If anybody's listening to this for the first time, you're thinking, wow, this sounds like something out of Africa voodoo. (laughs) And I can understand that. But if you look carefully, you're going to see one of the most beautiful pictures of Yeshua ever. Because here's what we've got. We've got, a, we've got a bowl full of water, and it's running water, okay? That instantly is connected to a mikvah, because that's exactly what a mikvah is. It has to be running fresh water. And then they take one bird, and they wrap it in scarlet thread and the cedar. So it's got cedar. It's put up against the cedar, wrapped in the scarlet thread, and then they hold the hyssop with it, and they dip it as they killed, the, they killed this bird, and the blood goes in there with the water that's running, and they dip the other bird. Can you imagine that bird? I mean, after watching his buddy get his head slit, put into and dipped into a small mikvah, he's shaking like a leaf, you know. And he's bound to this cedar tree with this red wool scarlet wrapped around him with, with hyssop. And he's going, what's happening to me? He gets dunked and pickled into this mikvah, and then comes back out, probably wipes his eyes and going, what's going on? Help, help. And all of a sudden they unravel it. And what do you think his first thought is? I'm getting the heck out of Dodge. And he flies away. The beautiful spiritual connection to this is this. The only thing that can free that bird are the items that are prophetically found there, which is blood, water, hyssop, crimson wool, and cedar. At the death and burial resurrection of Yeshua, when he's on a tree, scarlet wool, the scarlet robe, they have the hyssop branch that they put to his mouth. The spear goes into his side and what comes out? Blood and water. Yeshua is the bird that dies. The word says that no man lives unless he is crucified with Christ, comma. I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless, I live. How do you live? Because if you are bound, by the way, that's that, that branch that he was uh, nailed to, cedar. If you are bound to the cedar wood and wrapped in the robe of Christ, by the way, what is, uh, what is uh, the scarlet thread made of but wool what's wool come from a lamb and so you have lambs wool dyed blood red wrapping that bird to the cedar tree so that it is crucified with the other bird but it is instead this bird is crucified instead of this one even though it looks like it's going to be crucified and it is set free never to be seen again for sure That is the beautiful way that a leper is cleansed. So prophetically, what is God saying? We're all lepers. Now, why would he call us lepers? This is fascinating to me. Out of every sin in the Bible, think about this, he chooses to call us lepers? There's a billion sins. I mean, murderers would have been a good one. Adulterers would have been a better one. Lepers? Hmm. Because leprosy is the worst sin in the Bible. You can't get any better, any worse than leprosy. How, how do I know? Because leprosy is connected to the seven deadly sins. And I'm running out of time here quickly. But if you walk through the, de- the deadly sins in Proverbs, you find that every single one of them are dealing with the tongue. Slander, gossip, division of the brethren. When you have tongues of slander or gossip, you're destroying the face of God in the earth. So the problem is, is now we all are called lepers. We can't come into the camp. We're expelled from Eden. Understand? See the prophetic implication? We're expelled from Eden. How do we get back to Eden? 
we got to have somebody that is going to heal us and then cleanse us. The healing is very simple. The healing is done through instruction. But that doesn't mean that you're cleansed. That doesn't mean that you have relationship. This is why someone can, be, can follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Tanakh and not ever have eternal life. Because they can be healed and follow Torah. They can be healed and follow instruction. Their marriage can be healed by following the instructions. Look, it doesn't take a rocket science to say that if you don't commit adultery on your spouse, there's probably good things that result. That's healing to your relationship. The Bible talks about this. The Bible talks about this. All through the Old Testament, all these laws, if you'll just do what God says, there's healing. But that does not mean that you waltz into the Holy of Holies. That is different. That is cleansing. This is why Yeshua came. Yeshua did not come to heal you. Yeshua came to cleanse you. He did, not, he did not come to make you clean. The Torah itself can do that. He came to make sure that you are pure. Clean laws of purification. Healed. Cleansed. There's a difference between being healed and coming in and having relationship with the king that you're healed with. If we could truly understand this teaching, ladies and gentlemen, husbands, your marriages would be fixed overnight. There's a difference between getting her to forgive you and then owning her heart. That's your chance to say amen, ladies. Everybody pray for Daryl right now. <laughs> We said amen, not a standing ovation. <laughs> so watch this. So Jewish people today will say, Jesus, Yeshua cannot be the Messiah. Isaiah 53 is not about, the, the suffering servant's not about Yeshua. But yet they say this in the Babylonian Talmud. The Messiah what is his name? The rabbis say the leper scholar is his name. As it is said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem him a leper smitten of God and afflicted. This is what they say about what the Messiah's name is, is the leper scholar. Or the leper Messiah. Now what's so interesting about that is the leper scholar is someone who knows the laws of cleanliness for lepers. Now here's what's so mind-blowing. Did you know that there's only one person in the entire Bible of 39 books before you get to the New Testament that was ever healed of leprosy? Only one. In 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was the only one, the servant of Elijah, was the only one that was healed of leprosy. So up until this point, now how many lepers, how many know there's lepers all over the place in Jerusalem in the first century? Not a single one gets healed of leprosy. The priest probably have no clue what would they do with the leper that got healed. You would need what? A leper scholar. Someone that would know what to do. So the rabbis looked and they understood that the worst sin that mankind could ever do is leprosy, the Lashon Hara. Why? Because it's beyond murder. It's beyond adultery because adultery and murder stop. It's, con it's confined. It's contained. The murderous tongue goes on forever. You can't stop it. We have people that have contacted our ministry that are just now watching a negative video about me from four years ago. I fear for the person who made that video. Thousands and thousands of people, they'll never be able to stop it. It's murderous tongue. So God says all of mankind is leprous, is leprosy. So watch what Yeshua does. 
So we go to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. It says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Why did I put this up there? Because this is the verse that they just quoted. So modern day Jewish people today, rabbis will tell you that Isaiah 53 is about Israel. It cannot be about Israel because all of the other rabbis say it's about the Messiah. And we have it written in the Babylonian Talmud and all over the place. So turn with me to Mark chapter 1 real quick. We're almost finished. I'm wrapping this up. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Do you realize how off the charts amazing this is? Do you realize the kind of faith that this leper is having? You know why? Because he doesn't say healed. He doesn't say that if you're willing, you can heal me. He says, if you're willing, you can not only heal me, you can make me clean, which means he is, he is literally recognizing him as a priest because only a priest can do that. Then Yeshua moved with compassion. When did the compassion start? At the moment of faith and repentance. Stretched out his hand and touched him. Wait a minute, you don't touch a leper. The moment you touch a leper, what happens? You become unclean. What is Yeshua doing? He's taking his uncleanness upon him. As soon as he had spoken, he says, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. Do you find that a little ironic? The law of leprosy deals with the tongue, spiritual leprosy of the tongue, gossip and slander. And the first instruction that Yeshua says is, Do not go and tell anyone. What's he doing? He's putting him to test. See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer your cleansing, those things which Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. I know you're already cleansed, but to them, you need to go do that because they haven't done it in a couple thousand years, and they need to get their hands wet because there's a lot more coming. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. I call this the big mouth leper. And to spread the matter so that Yeshua could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in the deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Do you realize what is happening right here? Yeshua heals this leper and gives him one instruction. Shut the trap. Don't speak this to anyone. What's the first thing he does? Gets on Facebook. Jerusalem space. And now everybody knew. Why was this a huge deal? He'd healed healed people up to this point. Why was this a big deal? Because never has there been anyone healed of leprosy since the time of Elisha. People have been raised from the dead. People have been healed of lots of different things, but no one had ever been healed of leprosy ever in over a thousand years. Never even heard of it. The priest had never heard of it. So what did he do? He went and told everybody, and look what it did to the Messiah. Where does a, what does a person have leprosy? Where do they live? Outside the camp, outside the cities, in the deserted places. What did the person that leprosy do when he got healed? Told everybody. And what did it do to Yeshua? Put him outside the camp, outside the cities, in the deserted places. His mouth, even proclaiming good news, isolated the Messiah and caused him to switch places with Yeshua. Now Yeshua is literally living in the places of the lepers because he cannot go anywhere. He had been constrained, not by his mouth, by someone else. This is the dangers of being very careful about what you say and can extend to not just negative things, 
but keeping your word, keeping your promises, keeping your oaths, because they may restrict someone else. And you'll say, well, I, I, I just thought it was such great news. I appreciate you did, but you put me in a bind. You, that's what we say in, in English. You, you bound me. How many people in the city could not be healed? Because Yeshua couldn't even go there. He'd have been killed. Luke 17. In verse 11, now it, came, now it happened as we went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then he entered a certain village. There met him ten men who were lepers, who stood far off. They lifted up their voice and said, Yeshua, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. So it was that as they went, they were cleansed. He didn't even touch them. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. You're already healed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving them, him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Look at this. I think this is so fascinating. Yeshua answered and said, were not there ten that were healed? Where are the other nine? Were not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. This just tells us right here how important a thank you is. Yeshua healed 10 people and they all took off immediately. One person realized they were healed and said, you know what, before I go and I get fully cleansed, I want to just go over and fall at his feet and say thank you. You don't ever see this anywhere else in the Gospels. Not a single time. Yeshua just wanted a thank you. How Many times do we hurt people because we don't even just give a simple thank you. You didn't have to do that. Let's let the Bible speak and we'll end with just letting the Bible speak. I'm going to try to refrain from commentary as much as possible. Why are you laughing? Psalm 101.5, whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him I will not endure. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms 50, verse 19. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 11. A serpent may bite when it's not charmed. The babbler, in Hebrew, Baal Lashon, is no different. That's compared to Satan. A babbler is no different than Satan, it says, because that's what he does. Proverbs 10, 18, he who conceals his hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. I like that one. You know why? Because it says that those who, are, who spread lies are hateful people. They're just concealing their hate. So instead of dealing with the, the, the emotion that's inside the right biblical way, they're concealing it, but they can't conceal it. It comes out through their mouth. Proverbs eleven thirteen: 13, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse man stirs up dissension, and a gossip separates close friends. Proverbs 26, 20 and following says, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down, and where there is no talebearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They go down in the innermost body. Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver dross. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. In other words, he deceives himself. He's not lying to other people. He's lying to himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. See the connection? I told you. This is the abominations it's talking about. It's talking about the seven deadly sins. When someone is a talebearer or they have issues with, with Lush on Hurrah, the seven deadly sins are in their heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. 
or in English we would say the church or the congregation. Whoever digs a pit for someone else in secret, they will fall into it. And he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on himself. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. And a flattering mouth works ruin. The sad part is you may not see it in this, in this lifetime, but when someone destroys someone else, they're destroying themselves. And the best thing that they can do is be destroyed in this lifetime because if God, for whatever reason, does not give them what they deserve here, they will receive it in the heavens. I'd rather be ruined here. I'd rather my name be destroyed here than be destroyed there. I'd rather take my punishment here than there. Amen? Amen. I'd rather be humiliated before men than be humiliated before every man that's ever lived. Matthew 12, 36, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. And by the way, it doesn't say whether or not you've asked for forgiveness or not. Do you understand that? There's no like, I ask for forgiveness, I, my slate's clean. Do you realize that? Your slate is not clean. This is a foreign concept to the Bible. Unfortunately, there are many Christians that, that, that understand this wrongly and have been taught wrongly that all we have to do is ask forgiveness and God clears the slate. That's talking about repentance unto salvation. But everything we do is written down and it is never erased. Disagree or not disagree, that's called the book of works. You can ask forgiveness all you want. But there is a book of works, and it is dependent on what you say or do. Every word that is careless will be counted on the day of judgment. We better be careful. Matter of fact, if we knew that, how many believe, without a show of hands, that if there was no forgiveness, we probably would be much more careful? Let me, let me make that clear. To say that differently. If we knew that everything we said and, and did would not be erased and it absolutely would be counted against us, we might actually think before we speak. But this concept of compassion outweighs the principle of God's word literally creates sloppy agape. Amen. This sloppy grace that I can just live however I want, treat people however I want because I'll just eventually make it right and God will forgive me and wipe it off my plate. God does not like rape, and that's raping His Word. Ephesians 4.29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to, it's going to come out of your mouth. Why do you think it talks about that? Brawling and slander along with every form of malice. You see how it's all connected to what's in the heart. James 4.11, brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. That's why Miriam should have had no business even questioning whether or not you know, he should have married a black woman. It has, it's none of her business to even mentally think it is judging God. Because God's the judge. If it's wrong, he'll deal with it. If you're not the authority, back away. Police officer comes on the scene, you should back away. He's the authority. To tell the police officer to get out of the way is judging the police officer. That he's not capable and he has no authority. That makes you the judge. Well, guess what? You should memorize James 3 then. Because teachers are judged more strictly. 1 Peter 3.10, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak, seek peace and pursue it. What does that mean? Someone hurts your feelings? Seek peace. Someone hurts your feelings. You know what we need to do? Grow up and become at least the toddlers of God. <laughs> One day it would be great to be called an adolescent. But we are constantly called children of God. Proverbs 17, 19, he who covers an offense promotes love. Whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. The only one that is cursed is the one who mocked Noah. 
Noah made a mistake, didn't he? So it seems. He's lying naked in his tent. Shem and Ham and Japheth are his sons. Shem and Japheth walk in backwards and do what? Cover his sin. They didn't even want to look at it. Because if they looked at it, they might, be, they might be tempted to tweet it. They didn't want to do anything. <laughs> they just let it go. And what did Ham do? Ham exposed the sin. Because what was Ham? Ham had a website called the truth of Christian pastors.com. I don't know. I'm just making it up. Okay. I hope there's not one called that. All right. But there are people out there that feel like that they're the ones and their job is to expose people, especially ministers. I go back to the day of, of Jim Baker, Jimmy Swagger. How many remember those days when those men of God made massive mistakes? Praise God there was no social media in those days. But what did other Christian ministers do but to call their names out and condemn? Do you know we have no right to condemn? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And on top of that, you might say, well, whether they were saved, I don't know whether they're saved. It's not my problem. My job is to say, this is what they did and this is sin. But we need to love them, support them, come around them and pray for them. Today, you find a brethren that's in sin or a brethren that's fallen and everyone is all too willing to say, I told you so, this person is unclean, unclean, unclean. And did you know in the Bible, according to the laws of clean and unclean, the only person that's allowed to say unclean is the one that's unclean. No one is even allowed to look at a leper and say, you're unclean. It's forbidden. The leper is to have a cloth over his lip because it's prophetically talking about the, the, the tongue. And the leper, when someone comes by, is to say, I'm unclean. Do you realize the kind of humility it would take for a leper to say that? And in the process of him speaking the truth, he begins the process of healing. This is why God instructs the leper only one instruction. When someone comes around you, you speak, I'm unclean. Because he knows how difficult for a leper to tell the truth. It will destroy his pride. It will destroy his appearance. The leprosy is destroying his appearance. God's trying to show him prophetically, you've destroyed someone else's appearance. Now I'm going to show you what you've done to this person. And the only way to heal you is to make sure that you tell everyone that you're unclean. Shem and Japheth covered their father. They were blessed because of it. Ham chose to expose. And today there's a lot of people that feel it's their responsibility. Their responsibility. I've read this even online. Even recently about someone else. They said, I feel like it's my responsibility to let the rest of the body of Christ know about this person. Where is that written? Where you are the shofar of death. Where you're the one that's supposed to say unclean. Where you're the one that's supposed to ward off. Matter of fact, let me just prove it to you. The Lord is bringing a scripture to my mind. Lord, can you bring the rest of it to my mind? There's a scripture... Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. So Yeshua is 
is preaching somewhere, and I can't remember the details of the story, but someone will remember this because someone's way smarter than I am. And he's preaching, and the people are not responding to Yeshua. So one of the disciples says, Lord, should I call down fire from heaven and destroy them like Elijah? And Yeshua rolls his eyes and says, Oy vey, are you kidding me? I did not come to destroy but to bring life. And the idea is, look, there are people, and he says that, that if they, and they come to him and they say, look, and there's another scripture that says, Yeshua, there's someone out there and he's casting demons out of people and healing people, but he's not with us. And Yeshua says, it doesn't matter. If he's not against us, he's for us. And Yeshua is trying to give a principle that if you, are on, if you claim the name of the Most High God, we're on the same team. It doesn't matter what your theology is. It doesn't matter if you believe this or believe that. It doesn't matter if you believe Torah or if you believe Shmora. It doesn't matter. What matters is if you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, as your Lord and Savior, and you're following Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and body and strength, you are saved and you are a child of the living God. And if He considers you worthy to enter in the Shemaim, you better be careful because He might put you right next door in Jerusalem to someone that you didn't like. Just to prove a point that we're on the same team. Now, why am I saying that? Because God says that if someone sins next to you or is caught in offense, you're not to expose them. Why? They're your brother. They're your sister. You're not to warn the whole world only if it's a wolf. So I'll end with this. So how do we know when to warn and when to not warn? The intention of the heart. If someone's intention is to destroy and they have leprosy and they cannot repent and they have not repented, then you are to warn your brethren about this person. But if someone's intention in heart is not evil, but they got caught up in evil, who are you to judge? We've all done that. Every one of us have fallen short of God's glory. Who has not, when been pressed, told a lie? Who's not, when been on the highway, someone cut him off and you got angry and you said something out loud or in your head? Every single one of us. That's not leprosy. That's skin deep. So how do you tell? Here's my encouragement. Don't expose it all and you'll be safe. There's enough people out there that hate the body of Christ without knowing it. They say with their lips, I love the body of Christ, while they destroy people in the process that they don't even know. Stand with me tonight. And I want you to see this last slide as I read it to you. If we could all see the reward. That is in store for us. If we just speak life. If we could all see the reward that awaits us for restraining from Lashon Hara, our ability to restrain would be instant. Did you know there are rewards for not sinning? The harder it is for you to restrain, the more your reward is great. God knows how difficult it is. He rewards you based on your restraint. So let us find ourselves in a place where we speak life to one another. Let's not expose one another. And I know I'm talking a lot to the choir, but it's a good reminder. It's once a year this Torah portion comes along. And God says, I just want you to love one another, cover one another, recognize that that person's on the hot seat right now, but soon you're going to be on the hot seat. You don't want someone exposing you. And lastly, if you've blown it, if you've made mistakes, God will forgive. He always does. 
But his question is, is, do you want to be restored beyond what you were before? Or are you satisfied with living on the outskirts of the camp? To do that, you have to follow his protocol and do whatever it takes. Whatever level of your sin, you have to go at least, according to Torah, 20% more. You want to be safe? Make it 200% more. And then let the Father do miracles in your life. So close your eyes with me and focus on the Spirit of God in this place. And Father, we ask forgiveness for every one of us that have fallen short of your glory in this area. We've thought things, we've said things, we've had anger in our hearts, hatred in our souls, and sometimes it comes out bitterness in our tongue. The sting of our tongue, Lord, has left stains in other people's lives. Sometimes we'll never know how much sting there was. So I'm just going to give you a minute right now just to think in your head and If, and allow the Holy Spirit to bring to your memory if there's anything that you need to do to either number one, first step, repent, or number two, to go to the next step and to proclaim, I am a leper, and to make it right, number three. You don't have to get full restoration. It's totally up to you. So God, I ask that you just reveal right now to the people's minds and hearts that are listening if there's anybody they need to go to, anything that they need to do, they would swallow their pride and do whatever it takes so that you can lift them up in this life. Abba Yahweh, I pray you give them courage and strength to do the right thing. Open their eyes to the things they cannot see. And I pray that you would bring unbelievable restoration to every person who has made these mistakes, including me. God, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your compassion for those who seek your face. May the Lord God bless you and keep you May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be lifted up over you. May he be gracious to you. May he give you shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. We'll see you next week. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you, and God bless.